everybody in this room, and, except for like three people for over 40 years of age. I didn't say no, I didn't say 40 was bad, I'm just saying things, things happen in 40 years that you don't see at 39. That's all, that's the difference. So what is so important, why is this such an important age? Well, why is it such an age of distinction? Because at 40 years of age, the tissues now are going to be more likely to be torn with low energy. You don't need to go out there and fall on your shoulder 20 feet. It takes simple things. Somebody was talking about, you know, did a dog pull my arm and tear my rotator cuff? Possible. It doesn't take an awful lot. Soft tissues can tear either from a decreased blood supply. Over the course of time, the blood supply diminishes, tendons become more weak, they begin to tear. Or by abrasion, and we can see, we'll see that with rotator cuff tears. It doesn't take an awful lot. Osteostructures, as we know, osteoporosis, is more commonly seen in the older population, meaning greater than 40. When I say older, I just mean greater than 40. I don't mean, you know, uh, I gotta be careful. But I, 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 I can almost say that because I'm older than 62. Okay, so I, I know what it's about. Joints become degenerated. So we're talking about soft tissues, compromised tissues, bones not so good, joints are not so good. Some people are fortunate to get through life and don't have any of those things, which is a very nice thing, but those people are far and few between. Shoulder anatomy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come out with some, some shoulder anatomy because it's very, very important that when you go see your doctor, that you have a good understanding of how the shoulder works and what the purpose of the shoulder is. The shoulder purpose, the purpose of the shoulder is to put your hand in space. Mm -hmm. That's why you have it. That's why you have a shoulder, is so you can put your hand in space. So you have to be able to have a fully functional, muscular, skeletal a mechanism for that shoulder to work properly, 100% of the time. Osseous injuries, when they, when they hurt themselves, when they become injured, takes at least two months of healing in order to return to low levels of physical activity, not high level. And soft tissues, up to four months. Biology takes its time when it's healing soft tissues. Maybe not so much muscles, but ligaments and tendons, we're talking four months. So if you're talking about surgery on your shoulder, it may be at least four months before you really can say, okay, I feel pretty good. So with that in mind, let's just go to spend a little bit of time on this picture. What I want you to realize is that the shoulder is basically a golf ball on a tee turned on its side. Okay, that's the kind of image I want you to have. Deep inside here is the cup, and here's the ball right here. This is the subdeltoid bursa. We'll talk about that in a second. This is the subacromial bursa, where we're talking about bursitis. It's right underneath this acromion. This acromion is this piece of bone right there. Okay, that's a good reference point. The acromion is right there, the tip of your shoulder. The bony tip of your shoulder is the acromion. And right next to that is the AC joint. That's another problematic area. And what you see is these ligaments that come over. This is the biceps tendon. There's two, two tendons. One goes inside the shoulder, and I'll show you that in a second. But I want you to kind of think about this high level view of the shoulder. The bursa, acromion, biceps tendon, this is the humerus with the head, and the ball over here. We're good so far? That's easy. All right, let's move on to the next one. Questions? Oh, come on, I know you guys now. All right, so this is a side view. Now you're looking at the shoulder like this from the side. This is the front, right here, this bony prominence in your shoulder is called the coracoid. One biceps tendon comes off of that, and the other biceps tendon is coming up here into your shoulder. Here is the necessary, absolutely necessary rotator cuff. You can see how the rotator cuff comes from the side, the muscles come from the back, they come underneath the acromion, and they attach right there on the humerus, and it is a wide attachment. Everything from the sub, this is one, two, three, four muscles. Four muscles comprise the rotator cuff. It's a tendon, the cuff is a tendon, a very thick tendon, that unfortunately gets compromised quite readily in this population. Okay, looking from the side again at the biceps tendon, and you can see the biceps tendon is right underneath the rotator cuff. Rotator cuff is a tendon, okay? Now, one last picture. Take, we were still looking from the side, here's the coracoid process, so we know this is the front of the shoulder, this is the back of the shoulder. Now inside is this cup, this is called the glenoid, okay? And the ball sits here like this, on the glenoid, 
and then around the glenoid is a labrum. This, this is not labrum, but around the labrum. This is the labrum right here. The biceps tendon is coming in the shoulder. This is the bicep tendon. The long hair is the bicep tendon, and it attaches to the labrum. Okay? So we're going to talk about quickly all of those soft tissue injuries that cause a marked amount of pain in patients over the age of 40. Okay? So far so good? Sure. Questions? <laughs> Good. This is a good group. Last time we had questions all over the place. <laughs> okay, now, this is the first thing you got to do when you go see your doctor. You got to be able to distinguish between shoulder pain and cervical spine pain. Not all shoulder pain is intrinsic to the shoulder or coming from the shoulder. It may be coming from the neck. Okay? You got to remember that. So it's very important to have a determination whether the shoulder pain is due to an injury or the pain presents radicular pain from the cervical spine. Radicular pain must travel below the elbow. If you have pain in your shoulder and it goes below the elbow, it could very well be coming from your neck. That has to be considered. Okay, That's important. Determine the presence or absence of numbness, tingling, or weakness. That with pain below the level of the elbow, that's coming from the cervical spine. Okay. Now, radicular pain plus neuro neurological symptoms represent a cervical condition until proven otherwise. So if you go to see your doctor and you say you got shoulder pain, the pain goes below the elbow, and you got numbness or tingling or weakness, that's coming from your neck until somebody says, let's get an x-ray of your neck to make sure something's going on, and you may need an MRI of your shoulder or, and or your neck. Okay? That's important. That's the first thing you got to start. Can it also, any of it come from the dorsal uh, or that particular area that may be uh, partially uh, rough in that area that could affect the nervous system or something like that? Um, that's a good question. <coughs> but if you remember, if you try to remember up here where the, where the clavicle, where the clavicle meets the acromion up in here, there is no nerve. The closest nerve is, is the axillary nerve underneath your deltoid muscle. And then there's another nerve that runs underneath here. This actually nerve goes around here, comes in, and comes over here. So that's the only nerve that's going to be compromised. But that's not coming from the cervical spine. So you can't have an axial nerve injury, but it will present completely different. If you have an axial nerve injury, you won't be able to lift your arm up because it fires, it supplies um, strength or energy to the or electricity to the deltoid muscle. Okay. So anything else? That's a good question. Yes, sir. Do the uh, neck muscles travel through the shoulder? Uh, no. No, that's a good question. Because uh, people will get spasms of the paraspinal muscles, the muscles that are, that are on either side of the, of the cervical spine. They may go down to the trapezius, down to the neck. But these muscles do not cross over into the shoulder. The shoulder has, other than the deltoid on the outside, there you have the four rotator cuff muscles right here. There's one here, and there, if you feel the back of your bone, there's, you feel that little piece of bone right there, that's the spine. One of the muscles of your rotator cuff sits right above that, and one sits right below it. So that's the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle. That supraspinatus muscle, we're going to become very familiar with, okay? So that's where those muscles come from that go into, into the shoulder, aside from the delta. <coughs> Let's talk about impingement syndrome. This is the first condition that is very easy to understand. The pain is in the subacromial space, which is lateral. Okay, remember you need underneath that bony prominence, and I'll show you this again in a second. And it extends in the subdeltoid region. Remember that bursa that sits over this deltoid? If you come in, a lot of patients will come in, and the pain would be just right there in the subdeltoid region. And people will say, well, God, you know, inject my deltoid. No, you inject up here, because these two bursa are connected. If you inject in the deltoid, you're not going to get the source of pain which is up under the acromion, okay? A lot of people come in with just subdeltoid pain. That's the, this question right here. The syndrome is basically a bursitis. What is itis? Itis is Latin for inflammation. Bursa is the bursa. Tendon, tendonitis, again. An inflammation of the bursal tissue. The range of motion is usually good with an impingement syndrome, but you will have nighttime pain. Okay, so nighttime pain. Think about nighttime pain. In this, in this type of population of patients, you may get 
a bursitis that will occur with treatment time. Let's just see over here, man. Remember this right here. This nighttime pain, that's what brings people into the office. And they finally say, I can't sleep anymore. I can't sleep on my shoulder. I have nighttime pain. That's usually the symptom. Yes, sir. Uh, does bursitis go below the elbow? No, sir. No, it does not. I mean, there are because the bursa back here, and there's something over here on the side. But no, this shoulder pain, it's got to stay in the shoulder. If it goes down to the lower level elbow, think neck. So, this is impingement syndrome. We don't have to go through all this, but, but the most important <coughs> thing is that when you go see your doctor, the whole purpose of this slide right here is that somebody needs to examine your shoulder. You don't come in, put a little touch on the shoulder, and order an MRI. That's, you don't want that to have happen. You say, doctor, you're going to touch me? You're going to examine my shoulder? See, when I examine the shoulder, I'm probably doing 15 tests of the shoulder. Because before I get an MRI, I want to be very certain that I'm going to know the results of that study. But the purpose of the MRI is just to confirm what I found on physical examination so I can correlate what you're telling me. You're telling me I have nighttime pain, I touch over here, and I feel the burst is being tender, and I bring your arm up like that, I do a positive impingement test. Why would I order an MRI? Why am I going to waste your money on an MRI? You've got an impingement syndrome. Inject it with steroids and go home. That's why it's important that when you guys go in and see your doctor, make sure they examine your shoulder. And then when they finish the examination, say, Doctor, what's my diagnosis? I want to get an MRI. Oh, no, 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 no. What's my diagnosis? Then we can talk about spending my hard earned money on an MRI. That's the point of this, of this right here. Okay? This, this is kind of an important one because the bursa, the rotator cuff, and the bicep tendon all pass through the same region of the shoulder. Remember, the bicep tendon's right there, the rotator cuff is right there, and the bursa is right there. Okay, they're really, really, really close. And that's why we want to be able to examine the shoulder so that you can discriminate between one structure and another to know what you need to do. Because believe you me, you'd much rather have a steroid injection that works on the bursa <coughs> than a four month recovery for a rotator cuff repair because that baby a lot of my patients have told me that a rotator cuff repair is just as painful as a total knee. And that's no lie. It hurts. Yes, ma'am. When you talk about nighttime pain for the shoulder, do you mean when you sleep on the shoulder? You don't have the pain other than when you sleep on it, right? No, here's the, here's the critical distinction. Um, that's a good point. Um, when I mean first side is I just an inflammatory process. That presents with that is what causes the pain at night. If you sleep on it, that may make it worse, but it's the itis, it's the inflammation, it's the inflammatory soft tissue pain that presents at night. It doesn't present to, if you have an impingement syndrome, you're too busy doing whatever else you're doing, playing with your grandchildren or still producing income or whatever, you feel pretty good. But at night, when you say, Why is my shoulder hurting? It's hurting because the bursa is inflamed. Where something is bothering you, something that's inflamed. Inflammation equals nighttime pain. Okay? All right. So, here are the shoulder layers. Here it is again. Here's the acromion, subacromion space with the bursa, the rotator cuff tendon, the bicep tendon right underneath it. There's the head, there's the glenoid. So, you can see in that small little space right there, you've got a lot of things going on. That's the picture you want to kind of keep in your mind. The bursitis, rotator cuff, there's a capsule, biceps tendon, arthritis, if you want to add that. Okay? So just think about that as you go deeper into that inside the shoulder. All right. Questions? Yeah, I was um, uh, a tear in the uh, supraspinatus tendon. <laughs> Where would it be occurring? <laughs> Right there. I'll show you a picture of that. I got a picture of that. Okay, so right now we're starting the top layer. We're talking with impingement syndrome. When, you, when the doctor says you have an impingement syndrome, what's happening? This right here is the greater tuberosity. Everybody has that. Everybody has that. A lot of folks will have a spur. You go to your doctor and say, you got a spur on your acromion. You got a spur in your shoulder. That spur should be right there on the front of your acromion. So when you do this, or you do this, then that greater tuberosity and that spur 
come together and impinge the bursa, the rotator cuff, and the capsule. Okay? It impinges them, causes them to squeeze them together and causes pain. And that's because, to make a long story short, this muscle is weak and so that ball moves up a little bit. Okay? So far so good. Impingements in the middle two pieces of bone coming together and squeezing those four layers of tissue. First one is the bursitis, rotator cuff, capsule, and then the bicep tendon. Um, okay, so you come in, basically we inject you, because the steroid is what? The steroid is a strong anti-inflammatory medicine. So if you know that, if it's anti-inflammatory medicine, what's it going to do to a rotator cuff tear? Nothing. 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 Okay, so you come in, inject your shoulder, and all your pain goes away. What's the diagnosis? Bursitis. You come in, we inject your shoulder, the pain doesn't go away. It's not bursitis. It's at least a rotator cuff lesion of some kind, among other things. Something other than a bursitis, or more, more problematic than a bursitis. That's an easy test, okay? All right, if pain's not resolved, consider a rotator cuff lesion and tear, because that's probably the baddest actor that you want to deal with. Okay, rotator cuff tears. The dreaded rotator cuff tear. Mm -hmm. Very uncommon in the younger patients. Very uncommon. Okay? If you fall onto the extremity or have an episode of lifting heavy <coughs> object, doesn't take very much, then you have an acute rotator cuff tear. What is an, an acute rotator cuff tear? You come into the office and you say, Doctor, my pain is right there. I can't lift my shoulder because it's so dang painful and I have nighttime pain. That's it. You have a rotator cuff until proven otherwise. We'll go through the exam, but you won't let me examine your shoulder because it's going to be too painful. I'm not going to be able to do a heck of a lot. I just want to do a neurological exam to make sure it's not coming from your neck. I'll check your neck. If we clear your neck and you're not no, no numbness or tingling, then you have a rotator cuff tear. But this acute rotator cuff tear, this is not the most common presentation in this age group, to admit. Okay? So these traumatic tears are uncommon. What do we typically see? We see nighttime pain that suggests a tear that's coming onto the rotator cuff. Range of motion above the level of the clavicle, coming and trying to do overhead stuff, painful, difficult to do. Okay? So you come in nighttime pain, you have difficulty working overhead, and you try to avoid those sorts of positions, then you probably more likely have something going on with the rotator cuff. Partial tear, full thickness tear, depending on. Partial thickness tears of the rotator cuff come from, again, the abrasion between this piece of bone right here and the acromion. That's an abrasion thing, okay? That's one way you can tear it. Or, what can happen is underneath the rotator cuff, the part of the cuff that's against the head of the humerus, what happens is the blood supply becomes compromised as we grow a little bit in age. And when you do that, you pluck off one fiber at a time. So what happens, unfortunately, with that kind of tear is you'll come into the office, and oftentimes those tears have already pulled off, and they've retracted. So they're not sitting right there. And if that tendon is retracted away from the point where it's supposed to be, sometimes you can't get it back on. And that's, that's a terrible, terrible problem. Okay, so there's two ways to tear a cup in this age group. The abrasion between those two pieces of bone from the pinching syndrome. We've gone below the bursa, and now you're starting to rub those two pieces of bone, and the tendon now is abraded. Or from the undersurface, you lose the blood supply and you pluck off. It's actually called, it's more of an avulsion, one fiber at a time. And it's, it's a slow, slow process. So by the time you come and see me, you have a complete tear. And it may not even be painful. You'll have a nighttime pain, but you won't have any pain at all because it's just been a gradual sort of thing. Those tendons oftentimes can't be repaired. <laughs> Questions? What do you do then? Yeah. All right, well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's, not, that's, not, that's not a good place to end up. So here's your picture, sir. Partial thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon. Here's the supraspinatus tendon. Here's the acromion, greater tuberosity. And when those two guys start to rub, they'll tear the tendon. And you can see here the tear is on the top of the tendon. If you tear underneath the tendon, 
that's usually a blood supply issue, and that's a slow, progressive tear over several years. Those aren't too good. So often the pain with interference with daily activities, an interruption in sleep, you probably ought to think about a tear. There's certain ways we treat those. So far so good? Am I talking too fast? Okay. Chronic tears. Mark nighttime pain, simple daily activities are very difficult to do, and you get weakness from trying to reach. So these are complete tears when it's torn the bone from the bone. Now what happens to you guys sometimes, not you guys in particular, but when you get these chronic tears, there's another consequence. When you don't, when a muscle is not attached to the bone where it belongs, that muscle will atrophy. So these muscles become very, very thin. And then the body will fill them with fat because they don't have any more use. So when your surgeon says, well, I'm going to go put that thing back down. Well, if the tendon is here, and it belongs, if it's here, and it belongs over here, that tendon is retracted off the bone. So if you have retraction, and you have atrophy of the muscles, or smaller, diminished con you know, contour of the muscle, less muscle mass, and you have fatty infiltration, the likelihood of re-tear is extremely high. Okay, so the lesson here is, when you start to have some shoulder pain, best to spend the $25 copay and get it checked <laughs> early than to wait, because the consequences of a chronic tear are really not what you want. Yes, sir. I've had rotator cuff surgery and shoulder stuff, and they told me it was just a matter of time before I got my shoulder repaired. And now I got pain pretty much. If I do I have is it, do I wait to the point where I, it really gets like it was torn to go in, or at yeah. what point do I decide? You know, my time pain. I can't obviously be rolling my shoulder, waking it right up. You need to see some. I've gotten to that point. Okay. <laughs> and I still do stuff, you know, lots of stuff. Why not? But if it's a bad tear, maybe not. It may be, uh, well, well, I'll tell you something about that. But you probably ought to be evaluated to make sure you're not progressing to a, to a tear that maybe just be one sided one, and then you, you wait too long, and the next thing you know, you can't put the tendon back down. Then you're really, really in trouble. Yes, sir. At yeah. our age, what is your role in exercise? The, the best muscles, the best exercises you can do is something called internal and external rotator strengthening exercises. The function of the rotator cuff is to push the head down and pull it in. So if you're pulling that ball back in and you're pushing it down, then that greater tuberosity is not going to impinge on that spur if you have one. Okay? You don't, your deltoid is always going to be stronger than those four muscles. So if you don't want to do anything else, you just get that rubber band over there, you get that band over there, and you do your external, you put the band over there, and you do your internal. Strengthen your rotator cuff muscles. Go see a physical therapist, see a personal trainer. If, you're, if you already have a personal trainer, and you say, I want, I want some exercise for my shoulder, you don't have to do the deltoids and all that kind of stuff, biceps, I mean, it's nice. But in this age group, internal rotator cuff strengthening, that's what you need. That's the, that, that exercise, those exercises will help you more than any other exercise that you could possibly do. That's a good question, thank you. Anything else? Sir, you good? Okay. So here's a complete tear. Complete tear will not heal itself. Well, the recovery from rotator cuff is at least four months. Complete recovery takes six to eight months. Okay, that's a long time. There's a possibility of a re-tear. We kind of talked about that. If left unattended, rotator cuffs can lead to a major complication called rotator cuff arthropathy. That is one of the most painful phenomena known in the human body. That's worse than, that's worse than gallstones. This, this is rotator cuff arthropathy means you basically have pseudo-paralysis. It is so painful, you won't even be able to move your shoulder. That's how painful it is. <coughs> rotator cuff arthropathy. If one ignores the rotator cuff, the humeral head will escape in the socket, 
go up north and cause intense pain. So here's what happens. There's, you've got these four rotator cuff muscles. The supraspinatus sits right there on top. Infraspinatus is right behind it. And then when those tendons tear, they get pulled back. So as they get pulled back, that ball is going to go north. So it's going to go north, and where it's going to land? It's going to land on the acromion. And you're going to do this. And you're going to wear out your shoulder ball on the top side. And that wear is extremely painful. I mean, you get somebody, you just start knocking somebody in the shoulder just and then they're just playing around, and you can feel that kind of pain. But imagine if you've got that arthritis. It's much more than the arthritis in the general humor joint. So if you happen to get arthritis down there in the regular shoulder joint, that's nothing compared to this pain right here. It gets so bad, you can't even move your shoulder. And when you come in, you get like that, it's ugly. The only way you can repeat, the only way you can take care of it is a reverse total shoulder artifact. I'll show you that in a second. You gotta have a reverse total shoulder. There's no other way to take care of that kind of pain. Steer injection, blah, 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 doesn't work. Well, I will say, if you're 50, there's not an operation that we've started doing, but just this is what you should keep in mind. So here it is right here, rotator cuff arthropathy. You have a complete tear of the tendon, especially those two that come over the top, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. This one that comes in the front, the subscapularis, and the one that comes in the back, the tear is minor, not a big deal. Okay, the arthritis is painful and reverse total shoulder. Now it says here, typically don't do it under the age of 75, but I will tell you, we have done them now as young as 60, because it, it's a really nice operation. The nice thing about a reverse total shoulder, is there's virtually no rehab. But you lose a lot of function. You pay a very heavy price. And the only consolation prize is that there's not a lot of PT. Because you cannot lift heavy things above your shoulders. You cannot get that, that glass out of there. You cannot uh, grab a pot. You cannot grab the salt shaker. You can't do anything overhead. You have very, very little strength. So, you got one? Yeah, I got one. <laughs> <laughs> you like them? No, what I was saying is just saying that. <laughs> Those things, I haven't done anything. I'm told it can't be repaired. You rotate a cup? Yeah. And uh, so I'm not doing any reaching out. I'm using my left arm. Can you? <laughs> left arm I can. But not with your right. Yeah. Okay. So, what is a reverse total shoulder? Okay, so this is the regular anatomic total shoulder. The ball replaces the ball. And the plastic replaces the glenoid or the socket. And the stem goes into the humerus. This is a normal total shoulder. If you do not have a rotator cuff, you cannot have this operation. Cannot. Okay? Well, because what's it going to do? That sucker is going to go north. So you, we find you no good. Okay? That makes sense. So you have to have a reverse total shoulder. So what we do with a reverse total shoulder is take the ball and put it up here and take the cup and put it down here. Now, the difference is this. This shoulder, this ball, moves around in this glenoid like this, okay? Because it's, all the muscles are still working. Remember, rotator cuff goes opposite of the deltoid. When the deltoid fires, it pulls the ball out and up. The rotator cuff muscles come over, push the ball down, and pull it in. If you don't have that pull down and in, then that ball is only going to go north. But because everything works, this thing works, and you can put your hand anywhere you want in space. This one, this little cup right here, actually has pressure against the ball, and it glides on the ball. You see the different kind of mechanism. Okay, some genius designed this. Was it me? I wouldn't be giving this talk if I had. <laughs> so, so that's how that works, okay? For this one to work, all you need is a deltoid muscle. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. Just a. Can you swing like that, like do a crawl? You can do stuff down here. Yeah, you can do. You can do stuff down here. You won't. Yes, ma'am. If you had to have that surgery, would you be able to sleep on your shoulder? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Without pain. Pretty much, yeah. It, it really does a great job of getting rid of pain. It is a pain reliever. It is not a, a restore of normal function. I 
tell my patients that when you get this operation, don't plan on lifting more than five pounds. Okay? And you're not going to be working like you will. Because there's nothing pulling that ball back down so you can counterbalance the delta. Like everything has to be moved up. I mean, you can get your arm up there. You can comb your hair, comb your earrings, um, you know, comb that kind of stuff. But you're not going to be able to do a lot of, a lot of heavy lifting. Okay? Do you ever know before you go to surgery that you, that you let's say you plan to do the normal one, you go in here and, yeah, you go in here and say, hey, I gotta do this? I don't think that's a good idea to go that way. All you gotta do is get an MRI. And then the MRI shows that you have a, re I mean, it's, anybody can get an MRI, it shows you have a retracted tendon, but the tendons are sitting over here, and you got some muscle atrophy, you got some pad infiltration. Don't waste your time doing this or trying to fix the rotator cuff at the same time, because you won't recover from that. But go ahead and do this. Maybe this is, you lose some function, but you really will get rid of the pain. Yeah. The only other indication, well, one of the things we do, I'll talk about later, but we uh, use these a lot more now in fractures that we didn't do before, because the recovery is usually so quick. Regardless of age, whether you're 55, 65, 75, 85, 95. A 95 year old, it's a very easy operation. <laughs> Because there's like there's no muscle to, to fight. <laughs> Labral tears. Remember, these are usually in the younger patients because they dislocate their shoulder. But in older patients, you'll probably see a degenerated tear, which is normally seen on MRI or an MRA, which means I think you should die in there. I typically don't get the MRA in the older group, usually in the younger guys, because I'm not likely to repair the labrum in this age group. Okay, it's usually a degenerated tear. So they, they, you got pain. Now, where's the pain? The pain's not over here in the glenoid. It's not over here on the shoulder where the rotator cuff is. It's not in the bicep tendon. It's in the shoulder joint, okay? So if you got pain over here on the other side of the corticoid, you remember that little bony prominence? If you're over here, you're not thinking rotator cuff. It may be a label tear. Folks in this age group typically never have isolated bicep tendonitis. You go in and you talk to your doctor, and he examines your shoulder, and you have bicep tendonitis, that's almost never an isolated diagnosis. It's almost always something with the labrum or something with the rotator cuff. Because remember, those guys are stacked up on top of one another. Bicep, if you've gone down to the bicep tendon, you have bicep tendonitis, that rotator cuff is destroyed. That bursa is highly inflamed. The capsule's gone. You're in trouble. Okay? So when you get bicep tendonitis, so you got pain over here, thinking rotator cuff bursitis. You come a little bit closer to the middle, so you think your bicep tendon, you can feel your bicep tendon. Then you go a little bit more to the midline, and you got a shoulder joint, and you either got arthritis or a label tear. Okay, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Well, at least to me it is, and maybe not to you. <laughs> Questions? Okay, if you have pain over here in the corner of your shoulder, you're thinking rotator cuff bursitis. If you come more to the middle of your shoulder, you're thinking more bicep tendon, which you gotta think, well, maybe something else is going on. If you come all the way over to where your shoulder joint moves, you either have a label tear or you have arthritis, for the most part, okay? So point A, point B, point C. That's why it's important to examine the shoulder, because, I mean, they're all pretty darn close to one another. So lateral, middle, medial. So this is outside where the acromion, this is where the glenohumeral joint is. And that's where you see your label tear. So here's a label tear. Again, remember, this is the core, this is the front. Bicep tendons coming in. This is like the shiger tooth tear. <laughs> and it kind of looks like that. And this is the labrum. Now, this is really not a slap lesion in this age group. And what's been going on recently is that this labrum is usually degenerated tissue. It doesn't have a good blood supply. So sometimes you debride it. But what we've been doing now is this tendon, if it's still there, will keep pulling on this and cause it to be irritated and cause it to become uncomfortable. So what we're doing now is we cut the tendon, because it's not going to be as good, and we transplant it back down over here in the front of your, of your humerus so you can keep some of that function. Oh. So we cut the tendon and then we transfer it down over here so you can do it arthroscopically. Okay? So, you say, well, you say, well, you, why are you cutting my bicep tendon when my problem is my labrum? Because it keeps pulling on it and it irritates it. Okay? And just simply debriding it oftentimes doesn't take care of the problem.
So sometimes the chair would just go further down the front and further down the back, and it just just strip it off, get rid of my space, so I kept that pen there. So somebody tells you to do a bicep chin adhesive, that's what you want to do. Yes, sir. Hi, right, Doctor. What are your recent treatment patients? Yes, sir. Uh, in my bicep tendon, you put a repair, maybe you'd explain to people what life is like if you lose your bicep tendon. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do the bicep tendon thing real quick. Yeah, okay. that's good. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's part of the soul talk, too, because it's kind of an important structure. Okay, bicep tendon. <laughs> <laughs> A bicep tendon lesion in the older population usually is degenerative. And it's usually suggestive of a rotator cuff tear. And release is preferred, a possible transfer, not a repair. Okay, so um, the biceps tendon, what does the biceps muscle do? It doesn't bend the elbow, it turns the palm up. It's a major supinator form. That's what the biceps major function is. Not to bend the elbow, to turn your palm up. If you can feel in your, if you feel in your, in your um, axilla, right, or you know, in your right here in the bend of your muscle of your floor, you turn your palm up and down. You can feel that bicep tendon moving. That's what it does. It gives you powerful turning over. And if you can't repair it, then you start to lose that that supination function. Okay, it's not designed to flex your elbow. That's a different muscle. That's a great theory of the Alex. The bicep tendon is a powerful turn, turning your palm up, supinating. So you're going to start to lose that. Okay? All right. So sometimes you release it because sometimes you just don't, you can't make chicken salad. <laughs> so sometimes we can transfer it, but it's not a repairable lesion. Okay? So bicep tendon, when you get little Popeye deformity, but if you're really, really strong, what's happening is you still can have some function, but you get this bulge in the front of your arm. You might develop really pretty strong. So that's because the muscle is now is no longer attached inside the glenoid. Okay? There is when I say there's no loss of the function, what I really mean by that is you'll still be able to supinate, but you won't have the power in your instrument to feed. Okay? Now in the in the younger patient, it's much more important because they do a lot more of the supination. As we get a little bit older, hmm, you know, you can kind of adjust. But if you're in a workforce, you probably need to have that full function. That's why we almost always transfer them. But in the old population, most of the times we do, sometimes we don't. Okay? Questions? Is this too fast? Is this a good pace or is it too fast? Good? All right, good. I love giving this talk in Williamsburg because I'm smart people up here. <laughs> I'm not kidding either. <laughs> the glenohumeral joint. This is normal. That's arthritis. Arthritis is the gradual wearing away of the cartilage. Cartilage does not have nerve endings. It's not the source of pain. So, if you're wearing away cartilage in your shoulder, in your knee, in your hip, in your elbow, that's not the reason why you have pain. Rather, when you get to the exposed bone in the shoulder, in the knee, in the hip, that causes the pain because it has nerve endings. Okay? So this cat over here, there's bare bone there somewhere. That bare bone, when you put pressure against it, you have pain. Same thing in the knee, same thing in the hip. Once you get past your way on all that cartilage and down the bare bone, you're going to have pain. It only knows one thing, pain. And oftentimes with pain in the bone, painful bone, means pain will even know. Okay. So, here's an x-ray of a fellow who has normal glenoid, right? You all know that right now. He's got a nice humeral head. And there's some space between there, and this guy's joint is worn out. Okay, so you can see the ball rubbing up against the glenoid, and sometimes you'll see some extra bone down here, the osteophytes. But he probably has a good rotator cuff, right? Because the ball's sitting right there, and you can see this little curvature right here. So that ball's in good position. So this guy could probably get a regular total shoulder, an anatomic total shoulder. He doesn't need a reverse. Okay, so as we come in more up and kids understand pathology. The implant design, Robert and these guys got some great guys over there. I mean, they've probably done more of a total shoulder implant than they have a knee to hip. So you guys are really modular now, and you can switch from a reverse to a total and back and forth. And I mean, it's just an amazing thing when you've done a total shoulder. Only problem is they're very expensive compared to a total knee or a total hip. Hmm. So here we go again. Shoulder arthritis. This this shoulder has end stage arthritis. You can see the humor head of the ball. You can see the glenoid or the socket. There's no cartilage between the bones, and then there's the bone spur right there. OK? 
he was this guy's got really bad arthritis. But fortunately, again, he didn't find out pretty good, so he probably has a rotator cuff. The pain is close to the chest wall. Motion is definitely decreased. The pain is minimal due to the loss of motion because all of a sudden you don't move your shoulder anymore. You don't really have a lot of pain because you can't move your shoulder. So, no pain. The loss of function becomes a decreased level of function. The loss of ability to perform decreases one independence. That's what's important in this age group, independence. we got to be independent because that's really what we strive for. We've learned all our lives to be independent. You know, we really don't want to be without children. We love them to death, but you know, still, we want to be able to drive. We want to be able to go on a holiday. We want to be able to dictate what we do with our lives. We've got to forgive our independence. So don't hang on to this bad shoulder. All it's going to do is slow you down and take away your independence. Okay? Got it? Okay. Shoulder arthroplasty again. One can return to driving in about six weeks. You can return to golfing in four months and heavy activities in six months. There's a very low complication rate, less than 2% of nerve injury, that's what's acting in nerve we were talking about. Infection is very, very, very low, but it's also very hard to detect in the shoulder. And the, only, the biggest problem with this is, is like your knee. You know, you don't move your shoulder after a shoulder arthroplasty, you're gonna get a stiff shoulder and you're gonna, you still have nothing for yourself. So just like in the knee, if you don't move the shoulder, you get very stiff. The problem with the knee, I can take care of that oftentimes, but when you get a stiff shoulder, that's a very good, I can't manipulate it. So you, you're really causing a big problem. So if you ever get a total shoulder, you better move that baby a lot. Keep moving it, moving it, moving it. Okay, you're gonna get in trouble. So, the next big thing that we typically see in this age group that we don't see in the younger age group is fractures. Fractures because of osteoporosis, particularly in women. If a woman breaks her shoulder, she's going to be pissed off for a long time. <laughs> because it's just this pain for a long time. It doesn't seem you're going to lose motion. You're going to become painful. You're not going to be able to do the things you want to do. Simple things like getting dressed. So even though we can treat these fairly well, you know, this is an ugly injury, but we can treat them. Pain relief is good. Range of motion is compromised. And sometimes you get your strength. But I will tell you, um, today, not necessarily this one, but with a lot of fractures that we see in this age group, we go to the reverse total shoulder. Because we know that even though this looks really pretty, looks really, really good, and the head's still there, stiff, stiff, stiff. When you get stiff, you're pissed off. You can't sleep at night, you can't do anything. I mean, it's just really compromising. So, some people say, well, just go to a reverse total shoulder. The doctor, you know, I've got a good shoulder. Well, it gets rid of the pain and allows you to do a lot of things you couldn't do before. If this is a stiff shoulder, you're not gonna be lifting five pounds anyway because it hurts so damn much. But if you get rid of this and give yourself a reverse total shoulder, pain goes away, you can do things down here. You can get dressed, you can cook, you can do things that you couldn't do with a stiff rocking shoulder, even though it looks very, very good. And this is why, look at this guy. The head's right here. There's a shaft. You can put that thing back on. Some people try, I don't. I just go to the reverse total shoulder. Because it's so much, so much more rapid recovery, so much more uh, performance. And most importantly, get rid of the pain. Pain, I mean, maybe some of you guys have never had shoulder pain. The shoulder pain, if you've ever had it, it's really, really uncomfortable. Yes, ma'am. If you have a pain in your, uh In your back, back here. In your scapula? Yes. If you have pain there, I have actually cervical distemia. It is being treated by a neurologist in Baltimore, both sides, lots of different muscles. If you have pain back there by your shoulder blade, occasionally, whenever you sleep, I always sleep on my back, can't sleep on either shoulder. They're both bad. Um, have you ever perform surgery on somebody's shoulders that has cervical dystonia? No, ma'am. Because one time, about five years ago, and it's been five years since I, I sleep on my back for five years, and I went to a shoulder specialist in Richmond, and he said, you need shoulder surgery, but I don't want to touch it because you have cervical dystonia. I might make you worse. 
Yeah, if you if you get those muscles, you know, really too tight, yeah. you're not you're gonna get you're gonna get a stiff shoulder. You're gonna be worse off than mm -hmm. where you are now. I just I'd be very careful. You know, sometimes you may just have to, you know, just keep your range of motion in your shoulder. See, I can do pretty well in the daytime and things I want to do, and I don't have pain shoulder pain at night unless I was I can't roll on either shoulder, so it's I have lower back issues, so that's a problem too. But anyway, my, I feel like my pain in the daytime, if I would want to reach back, that causes pain. You probably, when you do that, you really have to pull your supraspinatus muscle to get back over here. You're pulling it over the top of your head. You're really, really pulling hard, and you're really stretching that muscle a lot. That is everything that's pain in the muscle. And so you might become all tired up. The inflammation is what bothers you at night. So you have that you have more of a myositis versus a uh, you know tendonitis or a bursitis. It's a myositis. So like a shoulder replacement is not in my situation is not even you have a good be, option. You have to be careful. Okay. Anything else? So <laughs> please go. That's probably, that's probably the only nerve to be exact. Okay, and that's <coughs> part of the lower part of the uh, brachial plexus up in the shoulder. The brachial plexus is a, is all the nerve roots come out of the neck and then they go into the shoulder and they they combine and they divide and they form what we call a brachial plexus. And then the brachial plexus sends all these nerves that go into your arm. And that's because it's one continuum. So yeah, you may have something up in your neck or it may be at the level of your elbow. You know, but that's the ulnar nerve right there. That's specifically the ulnar nerve at the lower part of the neck or at the elbow or maybe even up in the shoulder. But I told well, this one's kind of I would make sure that it isn't in the elbow first. That's probably more common in your neck. But if this is negative, if you get an EMG, like a monogram, and you check it. Now, if you don't have any pain back there, then it's probably going to be negative. It's like a C6, C7. I have a partial artificial elbow. Mm -hmm. And it's it may be the ulnar nerve. It may be more of a peripheral problem versus a central problem. Yeah, but that's definitely the ulnar nerve. Question, sir? Is there any stem cell technology being pursued? Did you ask this question occasionally? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's very interesting. Okay, I I'm going to have to start putting stem cells into my talk. <laughs> Let's look at it this way, okay? Um, there's been an abundant amount of research where scientists are trying to harness the normal biology of the body. So far, they've not been very successful. They can reproduce the biology, but they can't apply the biology. And I'll give you a perfectly good example of that. There's something called PRP, um, plasma... Um, Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> she sells it. So anyway, what, what are we talking about? If you cut your arm, the tissues in your arm know exactly what they do. They, they, know, how to, they know how to repair the, the lacerations. So the signals to those cells are on the platelet. We know that. We know that. We know it works. So what people do is they take a specimen of your blood, they spin it down, and they get the platelets and they concentrate it. Okay, that's called PRP, ACP, whatever you want to call it. But now you have a big concentration of platelets with all these signals. So sometimes you can inject it into the a lateral epicondylitis or a tennis elbow or a greater trochanteric bursitis. Some people inject it into the rotator cuff after they repair it. So yeah, we can harness that, but does it really make a difference? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. How many times do you inject something? I don't know. Who's going to respond? I don't know. How long is the, is the positive response? I don't know. There are more unknowns, there's more unanswered questions than there are questions. The biology definitely exists, but there, we can't harness it. Or take, for example, stem cells with cartilage in the knees, okay? So you take the stem cells, what did we say earlier? Cartilage does not have nerve endings, moreover, it doesn't have blood supply. So how are you going to inject this into something? You might as well inject it into a wall, because it ain't going to grow. Okay. You're not going to be able to attach it. So I'd say 15 years ago, we used to take, we used to take cartilage cells out of somebody's knee, 
Attic, attic check for ten thousand dollars. Send it to Boston, and they give you this nice sheet of cells. But you couldn't attach it back in the knee. It would last a day. You start to wait there, and it's all gone. Who in this room is going to go not laying there for four weeks? Nobody. Nobody. Everybody in this room is busy. Everybody's got things to do. You're not going to be not laying there for four weeks. Okay? I mean, literally, seriously, it's just not going to happen. And if you don't do that, then it's not going to work. So I think the scientists are really brilliant. They do, they're able to duplicate it. But we technicians, we clinicians, have not been able to apply it to where it needs to go. But more fun, even more fundamental than that, it's expensive. Every single insurance company, especially Medicare, <laughs> considers it experimental, and they will not pay for it. And so if you go get a PRP shot, for example, that's going to cost you $500, $500, and you're not even sure it's going to work, OK? I only charge 175 and I use it as, because I, I, can't, I can't answer any of those questions. But it might work. So why do I charge 175 Because the stupid technique costs me 150 and I throw on 25 bucks just for the hell of it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But other than that, you know, I mean, that's it. So I'm not going to charge $500 because I can't answer your questions. I, I just don't know how it's going to work. There are no level one studies. Level one means you know, prospective, randomized, double-blind studies. They do not exist at all. All the data you read is all anecdotal. It's all like, this is what I've seen, this is what he's seen, this is what she's seen. But there's no head-to-head -head studies. So, I mean, I'm a little biased. And by the time I retire and some younger person takes over, maybe it'll be perfected, but not, not right now. So I don't really talk about it, but I think because this question comes up a lot, uh, just like you know, it's expensive, nobody pays for it, and you, it might or might not work. Okay, I think there's one more. Okay, so general considerations. AIDS, soft tissue has a decreased tolerance to stress and needs to be maintained during exercising, internal and external rotation. But in general, all of you cats need to be getting some sort of physical training. It's true that if you're not exercising your muscle, your tendons weaken, the blood supply diminishes, and you lose function. So you should be exercising your legs and your arms, everything to keep things going. With each passing decade, it's even more important to keep the range of motion in your shoulders. Every single woman in this room should be walking, weight bearing, 30 minutes a day, three times a week, minimum, to prevent osteoporosis so we don't have to do a reverse on your broken shoulder. That's, that's that important. It's not that important for, not as important for men. We don't see osteoporosis as frequently, but we do see osteoporosis. And you're not taking vitamin D, how much? 1,200 milligrams a day. Vitamin D, how much? 1,000 international units. Every single woman in this room should be taking, should know those three numbers. They really should. Osteoporosis, we can prevent it. If you don't take care of it, you're gonna prevent it. You're gonna, you're gonna get in trouble, potentially. Evaluate your shoulder pain early because it's easier to take care of a lesion that's not bad versus a lesion, a lesion later on that may be catastrophic, okay? Shoulder surgery is painful. Although we're getting better, we really want to maintain independence. Okay, that's really, that's really the whole thing here. Yes, ma'am. I had total shoulder replacement of my right shoulder in 2006 when I, I fell and just totally uh, undid everything in my right yeah. shoulder. The ball was hanging over in the back. Okay. And the top of this bone was yeah. partially fractured. Anyway, I was fortunate to find that the doctor that invented the shoulder replacement. In New York? In Richmond. Oh, Richmond. Dr. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Warland, unfortunately, he no longer practices. He moved to Oregon. But I was fortunate to have him to do the shoulder replacement. And it, it worked. And I, my arm is very usable. Took a lot of physical therapy. Can you go overhead? Yeah. Now this is what this is okay. This and that's a very good point because you know, and you're very functional. I'm glad that that you know it's it's not very common that it happens. But we did we try it so it reduced and here then you kind of then you lean back so you can get your arm up higher. Okay, that that's a difficult 
the replayed. physical therapy for over a year, um, and I still have to do some therapy, uh, more than what I'm doing, really. But my shoulder is usable, and I was very fortunate to, to have the doctor that invented this to put in a new shoulder. Oh, indeed. Indeed. I, I, think, I think there have been some really dramatic improvements in how we manage shoulder pain and shoulder injury. And I'm glad that you, I mean, that you're an you're a uncommon uh, outcome. Um, I, was, I was 78 years old when this happened. You're 79 now? 2000. <laughs> 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 but it's a lot of work. Yes. What about the pain? Um, I endured some pain. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten about that now. Good. Yeah, good. I'm glad it turned out well. Today, most people would probably do a reverse total shoulder because it would get rid of the pain. And now let's face it, you know, when we were 20, we'd do an awful lot, but now that we're older, we don't, we're not out there trying to press 500 pounds. We just want to have a good functional, good function, good outcome so you can keep your independence. Yes, How much shoulder do you do a year? Um, I probably do maybe 40, much less than my hip and knee. I do 100 for hip and knee. You just don't see them as often. It's not as often uh, a diagnosis as the hips and knees. I mean, I did probably book eight knees today and four hips, and then you know we did some shoulder surgery and that's about it. But shoulder replacements, unless you go to like you know somebody that's all they do, they're going to do more. But in this community, um, there's just not that many. Yeah. Yes, when you say you come in early if you're starting to feel something and you have a small tear, what do you do for a small tear? For a small tear, what we want to do is we want to get rid of that spur so you don't have this anymore. You get rid of this, and so now you get rid of the bursa so you, that bursa doesn't irritate that tissue. Get rid of that pain, get rid of the spur. Uh, and if the tear is on top, you can kind of just smooth it off, but don't make it any deeper. If the tear is underneath, then there's a different technique to try to get that tendon back down the bone. But if it's 60, 70 percent intact, don't don't try to repair it because you're only going to make it worse. I would not compromise the remaining 60, 70 percent just to put a suture tag. Well, that's a really good question. I don't have any slides about that. But so what do we do arthroscopically? I would I don't think I've opened a rotator cuff repair in 15 years. So what we do basically is we capture the tendon. This is the tendon edge right here, and this has to go to this bone right here. What we do is we come in arthroscopically and we put a suture here and it has two tails. And how, we may put more than one or two. And then we take that tendon and we stick it onto it in the limb implant. That's a very good question. And the implant has a little island, and we put the sutures in the island. And then as it goes in, there's a screw right here. So when I push it into the bone, I drill a hole. I'm going to push this suture anchor into the bone, and so now the, now the sutures are deep inside the bone, and then I turn a mechanism and the screw goes in, and it captures the sutures deep inside the bone. Those are bioabsorbable, so there's no more metal. Um, you, and, but you can't still, you can't move very quickly, but it's a slow progress. That's for a big tear. Right. Now, for a partial tear, more than 70, 80, you just get rid of the acromion, that spur, Get rid of the bursa and just gently debride it and leave it alone. And what's the recovery on that? Uh, almost as long, probably a couple months. Mm. <laughs> There's no way to, uh, to uh, smooth the bursa without surgery. No, sir. You've got to take that bursa out. That bursa is inflammatory. Remember, it's, it's working hard to try and keep those, everything moving smoothly. When it, get, when it sees extra friction, Probably because the because the rotator cuff now is weakened and that ball is moving up, pushing that tendon up, and that moves through bone. So after you have the rotator cuff, after you get rid of that bursa stuff in the spur, a lot of a lot of internal external strength to keep that head down, so it doesn't bounce back up. Yes, sir. I'm sure all of us had more than one doctor, and I just want how much exchange of information. And that far back can go uh, between you and the other side and, and uh, Sincera and my individual doctors and so on about my records or somebody else's records. Very little. Very little. Very little. Okay. 
testing it on. If I don't you know, duplicate them and put them on a disk, my computer doesn't talk to anybody. And they don't talk to me. Riverside doesn't talk to Intera. Nobody talks to anybody. So this whole idea of like getting yes. electronic medical records, it's ridiculous. All it just costs is billions of dollars and nobody talks to them better than the one they did before. I don't know why. Yes, ma'am. Can you address a frozen shoulder? Oh, very good point. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. What is a frozen shoulder? That's a very good question. Um, let's see. Okay, this picture right here. These are the glenohumeral ligaments, of which there are three. And then there's an articular capsule. So what happens is you get maybe a little bit of bursal pain. Or maybe you get a small rotator cuff tear. Then what happens is you get a little bit of pain. And so you disincline to move your shoulder. So if you were here and it hurts you to do that, then you, next time you come up, you only come up maybe five degrees less. So what happens is that these structures right here become tight and contracted, and now you can't move your shoulder. So you quote unquote have a frozen shoulder because this tissue in here has become contracted and scarred. And sometimes you can just simply manipulate it under anesthesia because they're trying to do that. Now sometimes if it's not so bad, if you've only lost like maybe 10 to 15 degrees, then you should go to physical therapy and every month, if you've had symptoms, you probably need two months of physical therapy to get that thing going. And remember, what happens is like this young lady over here, when, she, when you move your shoulder, if you don't keep your, you gotta have free range of motion in this glenoid. If you don't have full range of motion in your glenohumeral joint, you will have pain. You will have pain. So that's what the frozen shoulder does. It, it prevents that free motion in the shoulder and you have pain. So if you go to physical therapy, they can do a good job of getting it going again. But if you go there and you find out oh, it just can't get it, then you got to go in there and release the capsule. But surgery is always the last option. Always the last option. Okay? That's a very good question. Thanks, man. I probably should put that in there. That's too quick for the time. Too tranquil. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you talked about the shoulder, oh, no. No, but... If you have pain in both shoulders, link neck. Link neck, okay? Because these nerve roots come out at the same level when you get both sides. I mean, you could have two rotator cuff tears, you have two of these, but think neck first, okay? I got five years ago when I had an MRI, I didn't rupture this in my neck. That could be present with pain. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, what is the most common cause of the pain in both sides? Yes, ma'am. What about repetitive motion, which is my problem? Everything that I want to do, Where's the pain? Um, well, more recently it was back here. This is not something that happens all the time, but for the last month I had an issue with this. I had to come back here, down here, a little tingling in here. Mm -hmm. Not much, but it was sore from the back of the shoulder down. I would, if it goes past your elbow and you have a little bit of tingling, Seriously, I would think neck. neck yeah. Think neck. Because you've got, I just saw you have pretty good range of motion in your shoulder. So with you, I would think neck. And you can have just arm knee, no, you, can, you don't even have to have neck pain. Most people don't have neck pain. No, but typically you don't have neck pain. I felt that it was because of the things that I do, which is painting. Uh, you could, but it doesn't sound like it's in your shoulder. Even though it exhibits over here, it's probably... There may be, there may be some, there's a bursa in the back of your scapula as it rubs over the back of your, of your uh, thorax or across the uh, chest wall. And you may have a little bit of bursitis back in there. You can, you can take care of that with physical therapy and maybe an injection. Boy, it's hot in this room. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I was diagnosed a little early last spring, I guess it was. I was having trouble with my left shoulder. I couldn't move it very far. And, and my primary care physician, when I went in, I had quite a bit of pain, so I tried to move it. Yes, sir. And he said, oh, you've got a frozen shoulder. Gave me a treadmill, I think, or something. 
tablets, which gave me a good deal of relief That's very right. quickly. And then he prescribed physical therapy, good. which I did for, oh, probably not more than uh, six weeks or so. And I was going out of town, and I let it go, and I haven't gone back to it. probably should have. I've, I've gotten probably 90% of the motion back. I mean, when I first went to him, I could only go back this far, and then I guess the whole upper part of the shoulder. The scapula moved this way. That doesn't happen anymore. I have a pretty good motion. I can't reach behind me, for example, put him on a shirt, put my arm through a sleeve. Uh, based on something that you said earlier, I guess maybe I should go ahead and have it. I think he did take x rays and showed, he said, he said osteoarthritis. And it looked like the socket had been chewed on by mice or something. Yeah. You know, the, the ball looked fine, but the socket was very jagged in part. So I, I'm wondering, should I, would it be best for me to go ahead to a shoulder specialist and have it further evaluated early on? I wouldn't have your shoulder looked at because t most often times when you have a broken <coughs> shoulder, that's, that's the consequence of something else going on, either a bursitis or a top tear, or maybe in your case arthritis. But like this young lady over here, I mean, a broken shoulder is not a primary diagnosis itself. Something irritated the shoulder so that you start to have a range of motion. The loss of motion and the contracture of that capsule is a secondary phenomenon. It's usually not a primary phenomenon. So yeah, find out the reason why you have a broken shoulder. And it may be simply arthritis. 